Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the attendees listening in. My name is Adnan Lokhanwala and I manage the home building automation and IoT power products at Power Integrations. This presentation will cover high efficiency power solutions targeted for smart home and building automation. Let's first look into some of the high level trends that are fueling smart home growth. Four of these are listed here and I'll talk about each of these. A fundamental evolution that is happening uh, in homes is a lot of the mechanical uh, products, for example, switches, sockets, and breakers are becoming smarter. As a result of which, power is needed for these new functions, uh, whether it's wireless connectivity, power for sensors, or actuators. Uh, when we talk about in-wall controls, which are things like switches, dimmers, for example, they need uh, the lowest leakage current. And we'll talk about that a little more uh, in the later slides. But essentially, in the past, uh, Many of these products would leak uh, milliamps of uh, current. Uh, and with technologies evolving today, uh, we are talking about uh, the consumption going down now into the microamp level. The, the second trend is essentially uh, what we call adaptive free charging. With the rapid proliferation of portable consumer electronics, uh, you know, which have batteries, um, there is a constant need to have these uh, charged at all times. USB ports are being embedded in many products. Uh, USB A ports have been very standard in the past. These are now being uh, more or less replaced with type C ports, which are also essentially enabling USB PD. And a lot of products, whether these are embedded in the wall, for example, whether it could be a standard receptacle is now having USB ports, things like power strips, uh, even appliances and even furniture are now embedding these ports. For these applications, small size and thermals are essential. And uh, at PI, we have a technology, what we call PAVIGAN, uh, is a very good fit for these applications. And you'll see that uh, later on in this uh, presentation. The third uh, high level trend uh, is the new building efficiency and the safety standards. Um, I've listed a few of these here. Uh, so if you talk about uh, the CEC Title 24 in California, uh, this new addition, which was effective earlier this year, uh, mandates occupancy-based indoor lighting controls. Uh, as a result of this, um, what you re require is that there has to be one light source which has to be controlled by a sensor. And this would be in your garage, bathrooms, um, you know, even a laundry room, for example. So as a result of this, this is becoming more or less a very common product now in homes. Uh, this is not just happening here. Uh, it is also happening internationally where you have uh, in China, for example, there's a gas leak detection standard, which is uh, effective next month. And uh, UL is, of course, a very well-known standard. Uh, they have a standard for smoke, uh, carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, and now they are at the ninth edition, uh, which this new edition, uh, which is effective uh, next year, has uh, provisions for detecting um, smoldering fire and preventing nuisance stripping. More importantly, new building uh, standards now require uh, hardwired uh, smoke carbon monoxide alarms uh, with a battery backup. So essentially in the past, where a lot of these were battery powered products, uh, the newer codes are now requiring them to have AC to DC power supplies in these products. Uh, the last trend here is, um, you know, what we see as essentially hubs uh, within homes. So smart speakers are essentially becoming, um, you know, gateways for home automation. Uh, and a lot of this is due to the lack of a global connectivity standard to some extent where these products are integrating a lot of the wireless protocols, uh, but they also uh, are covering uh, what we call audio performance and newer functions. Uh, so for example, in the past, uh, audio was never that uh, key essential component for these devices, but the newer products now are essentially focusing on audio performance and new functions. For example, things like wireless charging or even USB ports so that you know your uh, cell phone can be charged while you're playing music. 
so the power levels are also increasing there I mean, we had in the past about 15 20 watts uh, the newer products now are, are, have embedded power supplies or adapters that can cover up to 45 watts um, a trend clearly with this is that there is a big focus now more towards a very light load efficiency specifically at about five and ten percent um, and uh, because these products are in standby for most of the time uh, where the audio is not being played very heavily. Um, so the light load efficiency becomes a very critical component. As a result of this, uh, the entire smart home ecosystem um, has kind of evolved and uh, we've tried to show them here into five uh, major buckets. So let me start from my top left and walk my way around clockwise. So the first segment, uh, when we talk about smart wall controls, this includes things like smart switches, occupancy sensors, um, and some examples are shown here. But there are also now newer intelligent devices where even things like your voice assistants are being embedded into these products, um, as you can see. So it's kind of becoming also to some extent a mini hub, um, if you'd like to call it, uh, within a, a room. Uh, the next segment is what we talked about earlier. This is more about smart sockets, where a lot of the standard AC-only products, whether it's a receptacle or even a power strip, um, are now becoming intelligent with USB ports, uh, and in some cases also intelligence where you could remotely control this, um, you know, measure the power consumption and turn your AC ports on and off remotely um, uh, through very standard smart plugs. Uh, the next segment is, uh, we categorize that as what we call protection security. Uh, this would include a lot of uh, the smoke carbon monoxide alarms, also things like AFCI, JFCIs. Uh, you know, these are standard devices uh, which are now in homes, uh, which protect you from, you know, ground leakage current or even arc faults. Uh, and these require, uh, you know, microcontrollers sitting inside and they need a very uh, mini power supply that can cover power for these functions. Uh, the fourth segment here is what we call motorized products. Uh, so this would be anything that would have, let's say, a small DC motor or even AC motor for that matter sitting inside. And a couple of examples here, things like smart blinds. Uh, these essentially, uh, it's a new product, you know, it's a new category of devices where they would have a small DC motor sitting inside. Uh, the other one shown here is what we call a recloser. Uh, so this is another example of a smart circuit breaker. Uh, where your typical mechanical circuit breaker, uh, it's an add-on element which couples to the circuit breaker and in many cases could turn the breaker on and off, uh, which is being used in different countries. Or the breaker itself could have intelligence where it could be, you know, sensing the line or measuring the current and detecting faults and communicating with the users. And the central piece of this, which is the gateway, uh, which is shown, shown in the middle, this essentially uh, becomes the central component within the home that communicates with all these devices in many cases. And, you know, smart speakers, and I think many of you will already be familiar with that, whether it's, uh, you know, the Alexas or the Google Home Assistants uh, or Siri for that matter, uh, many of these products integra integrate these uh, voice assistants, but also the different uh, wireless communication protocols. Uh, whether it be uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave, which are kind of well-known. Um, the one you see uh, there in uh, blue, uh, this is what is called CHIP. And uh, this is, in fact, a working group within the Zigbee Alliance. And they are developing a new connectivity standard uh, across all smart home devices. So the lack of uh, this global connectivity standard has uh, been a big issue in the smart home uh, space and some of the powerhouses um, whether it's Apple, Amazon, Google have kind of come together for once and they are uh, working on uh, this particular uh, chip which would uh, potentially simplify the smart home ecosystem for many consumers. So let's deep dive into uh, some of these segments and uh, understand what are the challenges when uh, many of the customers are designing these kind of products. So we talked about smart wall controls. Um, this is uh, essentially 
some of the products that you would very commonly see are shown here. Uh, in many cases, they would be, you know, standard dimmers, or they could be even have a lot of uh, intelligence uh, with sensors as well as wireless connectivity. Uh, a fundamental challenge uh, with the when these kind of products are designed is older homes typically only have a line wire, uh, and there is no neutral return wire. Um, and there was really no reason to have a return wire because the mechanical on-off switches did not require a power supply. Uh, they would simply open or close the circuit. Uh, there are some products uh, that in fact leak through the load, um, but if the power supply is not efficient, that could result in LED lamp uh, flicker or ghosting effects, uh, which is not very you know acceptable for consumers. Occupancy sensors, a lot of them today use the ground wire um, as a return path uh, for the power supply. And uh, there is a regulation out there, which is UL 773A, which is a standard for safety of non-industrial photoelectric switches for lighting control. And they do allow 500 microamps of leakage. So from a high level, there are three fundamental uh, wiring configurations. Uh, the first one you can see on the left is called the line only configuration. Uh, the black box there is essentially the mechanical switch which is now replaced with a smarter switch. So you see a relay in there, a power supply, and then sensors and connectivity. Uh, so that's what we call the line only configuration. Um, this is line only or the no neutral configuration which is very commonly seen today and most challenging in terms of design. Many customers are in fact doing designs purely based on line only. Uh, the next one would be the line plus ground configuration where you have ground wire uh, again, this is very country specific. Um, in North America, you would see a lot of uh, uh, switch boxes that have a ground wire, uh, but in other countries, uh, they, they would not. Uh, so this is what we call the line plus ground configuration, where a lot of the occupancy sensors today are um, being designed. And then the last one is what we call the line plus neutral configuration, which is, uh, from a design perspective, may probably be uh, the least challenging. Um, but as you pack more power within these kind of products sitting behind the wall, there are different challenges uh, associated with those kind of products. The Link Switch TN2 product family um, is pretty much designed uh, to be catering to a lot of these uh, in-wall kind of applications, and it can cover many different topologies, whether it's a buck, a buck boost, as well as a non-isolated flyback implementation. Uh, again, this integrates um, a lot of the functionality inside, as you can see uh, from a couple of schematics shown here, whether it's a high side puck or a non-isolated implementation. Um, the main power device, a lot of the control is uh, integrated and you have very few components to design an AC to DC power supply. Um, the Current levels in the case of a buck implementation are shown here. So you can in fact be designing, uh, you know, with the uh, up to about 575 milliamps of current in a buck amp implementation. So that's close to about four or five watts if you're designing a 12 volt output uh, buck design uh, for non-isolated. So that's enough to cover uh, power for a lot of functions within these kind of products. And, you know, different packages are available. Uh, there is also a 900 volt option. So when consume or when customers are designing for unstable line voltages. Uh, so internationally where the, the grid is not very stable, uh, there is again a 900 volt option uh, for these devices as well. So a key focus, as I mentioned with this product family, was um, you know to reduce the power consumption at light loads. And fundamentally this uses um, a control scheme, what we call on and off control. Uh, where the main power MOSFET simply turns on only when power is required. And this is very different from traditional PWM controls. Uh, in PWM controls, you would you know, have to turn on the MOSFET on every cycle or the switching uh, frequency. So as a result of which, there will be an impact on light load efficiency or even no load power for that matter. Uh, in this case, we only turn, it off, turn on the device when power is required. Um, so this allows us to have very good light load efficiency as well as you know very good uh, no load power consumption 
So as you can see from uh, this chart here, so the link 3202, which is the smallest device, this enables the lowest leakage current uh, in the market today. And we've compared it with a few different devices out here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, a lot of these products in the past, um, they did not care a lot about leakage current. And primarily that was because the, the lamps, or for example, that a switch is powering, these used to be incandescent lamps. Uh, with the transition to LED, I think they're realizing that the leakage is so critical um, that, uh, you know, the old approach would just not work. So what you see here in the case of an RCC flyback, for example, uh, it consumes, it, you know, close to a milliamp at, at high line. And um, this would essentially uh, have a detrimental impact on, you know, the, the LEDs flickering and ghosting. Um, so the lowest current is uh, preferred by a lot of uh, customers and uh, this keeping it at the lowest level also allows their solution to be compatible with more and lower power LED lamps. So uh, the focus is really how low can we go uh, and the lowest you can actually get it to uh, helps them with the compatibility issue uh, with different kind of lamps. So to enable and support customers building these kind of products, we've actually done a complete system. Uh, this is an example here, which is the DER832. So this is a no neutral uh, BLE smart switch. So essentially it's got um, pretty much the complete intelligence that you would need to develop a smart switch. This is again designed with the link switch into 3202D device, and it's compatible with no neutral wiring. Um, you can actually see that uh, with the image here. So you'll see that there's a white wire, which is typically the, uh, the neutral return wire. That wire is not connected to the, the PCB here, which is uh, having a lot of the intelligence. It's essentially just going to the lamp, which is connected on the right side. And then the black wire, which is the line wire, is connected to the PCB and then connects to the switch uh, to turn on and uh, turn off the device. So this complete system, um, consumes less than 100 microamps of leakage current, even with the BLE connected. Uh, and in this case, we are using a Nordic uh, BLE device. Uh, so the complete system consumes very little current. And if you go back to uh, some of the implementations we were talking about earlier, uh, this could allow you to even kind of uh, design a device, uh, which is very easily less than 500 microamps of leakage current. We also have a smartphone app. So this could, uh, this could be a great tool that, you know, customers uh, can use to uh, get started with their system to understand how much consumption, you know, can you turn it on and off? And you can see it's got the relay, the BLE, and, and the power supply sitting in there. So this would be applicable for lighting control, wall switches, dimmers. Again, uh, things like wall switches for even motorized shading and involved transmitters, receivers. So it's a very good tool to um, understand the complete system and uh, how you would design that. We also have a very more or less fundamental tool, which we call the RDK623. And this is just the power supply portion. So in many cases, you know, depending on the end product your customer is trying to design, uh, we also provide this just as a power supply by itself. This is similar to the power supply you saw in the, the earlier uh, design. And it would give you two outputs, a 12 volts and a 3.8. A 12 volts would be for the relay power and then the other 3.8 volts could be used for a microcontroller or a sensor. And this is a very compact one inch by one inch uh, you know, design, which again, you could take, and the customer could in fact retrofit on their existing system uh, you know, to get a good initial start on you know, how the product uh, would expect it to be, you know, perform, what the functionality would be, what the performance would be. So it's a great starting point in many cases. So if you don't have the, the previous design, uh, this is a great, tool to start with uh, to get the customers going. Now let's shift gears uh, to another segment which continues to evolve and grow at a very fast pace uh, within smart homes. So when we talk about adaptive free charging, um, a lot of uh, these products when, which you were mentioning earlier are embedding USB ports. And 
when uh, the requirements for the power supply are very stringent for these applications. And if you if you try and look into this uh, a little more deeper, uh, these applications uh, where you are, for example, in a wall receptacle, you really have no airflow. Uh, there is a limited size and the internal ambience, because you're sitting inside insulation, um, can be very high. In some cases, it even goes up to 70 degrees C. So the power supply has to be extremely efficient, and more importantly, the thermal performance has to be very well balanced to, to kind of meet your safety requirements, uh, because there are requirements on you know what the maximum temperature could be on the faceplate, for example. Uh, so these are very critical uh, requirements when you're designing these kind of products. Uh, 30 watts, uh, you know, today is already a reality. In fact, there are products now in the market um, that use in a switch and um, are becoming very common uh, to be able to power phones and tablets. Uh, you know, with the standardization of Type C, and I think another big important trend, which is a lot of the consumer products uh, now are, and in the future, will potentially ship. Uh, without inbox chargers and adapters. As a result of this, this would only accelerate the growth for this segment. So a couple of examples are shown here. The one on the left is, uh, you know, a product which in the typically in the past you would see like a, just a USB kind of A port. Uh, but now for consumer convenience, they're also adding wireless charging to that. So in fact, it would just be a very great approach where you don't require even a cable to charge, for example, your phone. Uh, and on the on the right, uh, you can see it's basically two Type C ports, and you can in fact get even 30 watts on a single port. So InnoSwitch, uh, as we constantly look to find you know ways to integrate power supplies, uh, InnoSwitch is clearly something which is uh, achieves that goal. This is the first IC to combine primary and secondary sides of a power supply across the safety barrier. And this is enabled by what we call the FluxLink uh, technology. And you can see this is very simplified implementation of a power supply. And you can see the primary FED, the primary controller, uh, even the, the, the isolation and the secondary side uh, controller for the synchronous rectifier are all integrated in a single package, which allows us to drastically reduce the component count and the complexity of a power supply. More importantly, since the primary and the secondary are now communicating with each other, uh, we can build a more intelligent power supply, which is highly efficient and very low standby consumption. So currently we are at uh, the second generation, what we call the InnoSwitch 3 ICs. And now these also have an option um, with, with the PowiGAN uh, so essentially, we can increase the power level for these uh, for this product family. So the InnoSwitch 3, uh, the base family that we had, uh, which silicon transistors, um, still are very highly effective, up to 65 watts of power level. So if you're trying to design, uh, you know, many of these devices, um, they are still very good. But if you are trying to push the performance boundary, um, then PowiGAN clearly becomes a very uh, significant uh, element that will help you to get there. Uh, so these PowiGAN switches provide more power, so there's lower RDS on per unit area, and there's lower switching losses. And you can see uh, in the table here, the what we call the size 8, 9, and the 10 devices essentially help you push the uh, power levels and the performance boundaries within the same package. So we have several different um, product families with PowiGAN devices. Um, we have the InnoSwitch 3 uh, CP, which is for a lot of fast charging uh, and USB ports. We have it for open frame applications. We also have InnoSwitch 3 Pro, which I'll talk about a little more, uh, which is implements dig digital control with an I2C interface, and uh, a couple of other families, which we have uh, for displays, which we call the Inno3 uh, MX, and then the light switch uh, 6 for lighting applications. Uh, all these families have uh, PowiGAN um, integrated. So here is an example of uh, what this PowiGAN technology can enable. So this is a design which is uh, very targeted for receptacle applications. 
um, and it's a 60 watt power supply. Uh, this is can support 5 volts to 20 volts, which is typically now required if you want to charge, for example, either a cell phone or even go up to a notebook. Uh, this is extremely efficient. Uh, you're looking at close to about uh, greater than 94% efficiency, as you can see here at full load. Um, and but more importantly, you'll see that the all the components on this design, and even at 50 degrees ambient temperature, are less than 100 degrees C. So the delta T is extremely low, even when you're talking about 60 watts uh, for this application. Uh, so we are. Uh, it's about a two-inch cube uh, size in terms of volume. And we're talking about 60 watts, so it's enabling close to about 30 watts per cubic inch and with very low standby power. And as you can see here, this is uh, supporting the different output voltages, uh, so you can in fact do a USB PD implementation uh, and in fact have 60 watts now in a receptacle application to even charge your notebook. Uh, so this is clearly uh, breaking uh, boundaries in terms of performance uh, for switch mode power supplies. Another uh, implementation of uh, Pavigan. Uh, so we talked about this InnoSwitch 3 Pro functionality. Uh, so this is essentially um, implementing I square C within the power supply. So you could, in fact, do a digital control uh, with these kind of products. Now, when we're talking about multi-port designs, as you can see here, um, let's say you're doing a 2C uh, design, there are different categories of uh, type c ports um, so fundamentally they're categorized as let's say a, a short capacity port or a shared capacity port in multi-port uh, terminology uh, a short capacity port would be one you know that for example if it's a 60 watt power supply and you say two type c ports each of them is a short 30 watts so that's the maximum you're going to get per port but if it's a shared capacity port uh, that 60 watt can now be shared and you can provide the entire 60 watts on a single port if the other port is not used. From a user or a consumer perspective, clearly the latter approach is great because maybe you're just charging one device and you would expect the power supply to be smart enough to share the power. Um, now, a typical approach when you're doing a shared capacity um, design, you would have a front-end power supply and then you would have DC-DC converters. And that's approaches shown on this uh, power supply you see on the left, uh, where you can see those two DC-DC converters. But the challenge with that approach now is when you have two stages of conversion, uh, you're talking about uh, reduced efficiencies. So for example, if it's a front-end uh, flyback with 92% and you have another 96% DC-DC converter, uh, the net efficiency is close to about 88% for the two stages. So the end-to-end -end efficiency is impacted uh, and you're dissipating close to, let's say for a 60 watt design, you're dissipating close to seven watts or higher power, which now has to be dissipated within that very small size. Uh, the approach what InnoSwitch 3 Pro enables us to do is what you see here on uh, the implementation. A simplified implementation is shown here where you could have uh, current sharing between two power supplies. So essentially you would have uh, two power supplies and they could be sharing the output current depending on which uh, port is connected. So as a result of which, you could have the entire 60 watts on a single port while the other port is not connected. And when the second port is connected, uh, the power balance is maintained between the ports so that you could charge, for example, a laptop and then also a smartphone. Uh, wherein the, uh, a short capacity, if each of them were 30 watts, in many cases, you would not be able to do that because 30 watts may not be enough uh, to power a laptop fast enough. So this approach clearly uh, does allow you to uh, improve the efficiency, you know, have lower component count. More importantly, it's better thermal management uh, because now you don't have hot spots in the design. Heat is distributed around the entire housing. And then you are eliminating also the high frequency DC-DC converters as you can see there which have been known to have a lot of radiated EMI challenges in these designs. So the design on the right is essentially what you would enable with this approach. You can see that it's a smaller size than the original design. It's more efficient, you know, and has lower component count. Uh, and this is what InnoSwitch 3 uh, Pro can enable uh, for these kind of applications when you're doing multi-port designs. 
Due to the paucity of time, I was not able to cover a lot of the reference designs and tools at your perusal. Um, so this is, I certainly wanted to kind of show it out here. Uh, this is the IoT micro site, which has a lot of the designs I have shared today, but also many that I could not include. Uh, but it also has selector tools, application notes, you know, videos, etc. So this is, would be a great repository to um, refer customers to, and also as FAEs probably look at some of the designs as a starting point um, when you are covering customers and applications uh, that serve home building automation and in fact IoT kind of products. Thank you very much for your time and attention.